Hello, how are you? I was just uh, beating up on this class because over half of them didn't do their homework. But that's okay, you do not have to do your homework. There's plenty of manual labor jobs in the world. Um, somebody needs to make my Arby's big roast beef sandwich. It could be you, right? So don't worry about doing that homework, okay? Uh, manual labor jobs are great. That's why there's so many of them. Um, hey, how's everybody doing? Good? Yes? All right, let's go through. Um, we're going to go, we're going to finish up chapter 20 today, and then we're going to continue on into chapter 21, which we started last time, right? So let's go ahead and do that. I assigned problem 20 dash 4b. Is that correct? Okay, let me go ahead. I'm not going to work through this one slowly like I did uh, the other ones, okay? So let me kind of show the answers. Uh, once you do a few of these, hopefully it gets a lot easier. So, okay, the first thing we do, make sure these numbers are checking out for those, for those few of you who did it, okay? Um, is that what you got for the first part? Okay. This is the beginning goods and process. These are the costs incurred this period. These are the costs that we have to account for, right? Then the next thing we do is we take a look at the unit cost information. All right? The unit cost information. And is that how? Okay. Okay. And then what do we do after that? We figure out the equivalent units of production. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we take these numbers here. The 100,000 are 100% 100 complete. So 100,000 times 100% 100 is 100,000 for each product cost. The 12,000, it's 100% 100 complete in regards to materials. But in regards to direct labor and overhead, which is applied on direct labor, it's only 25% done. Is that correct? So 25% times 12,000 is 3,000 equivalent units of production. OK, cool? I think that's the end of the first page of your uh, template. Is that right? Mm -hmm. OK. Then we go to the top of the next page. Um, we take these beginning goods in process and incurred costs incurred this period for each product cost. We get that from up here, okay? And we get those, then we add those up to get our total costs. Then we divide that by the equivalent units of production that we computed up here. And we get cost per equivalent unit of production, right? Okay. Then we continue on, and we have our last cost assignment and reconciliation. All right, we take those equivalent units of production. Um, well, those, those, uh, yes, those, those, uh, what, do they, what do they exactly call them? The cost per EUP. Okay, put those there. Take those equivalent units of production that we solved for earlier. We compute these numbers. We add those numbers up. And of course, the big question is, does that number equal this number by my thumb from the first page? And it does, doesn't it? Okay. So, and which of those numbers goes down to the journal entry? Million 160. The cost transferred out. So the journal entry is thus. All right. Cool. Okay, any questions on that? Anybody? All righty then. Okay, let me talk about, you can come off that. Let me talk about how we're going to, I'm going to assess you over that. Okay? Um, I thought about a number of different ways of doing this, and what I was going to do was, was going to give you a 15 point mini project on connect, kind of like I did the cash flow statement in the chapter 17. Remember those? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, I'm not going to do that. And the reason is, is because I, I went in uh, a couple days ago and tried to do one of these. And it was one of those where I know how to do it, but I, I for the life of me couldn't figure out what numbers they wanted me to put in what boxes. 
and it was just, it was one of those things where technology just isn't working very well. So here's what I'm going to have you all do, okay? First of all, let me talk to you face-to-facers, and um, if you guys are, if somebody's watching this that is a, in one of my other face-to-face -face classes, and um, I'm going to be doing this for you as well. Um, after class, I'm going to give you a problem to do, and it's going to be considered like a 15-point <coughs> mini project, okay? It's 15 points towards your grade, okay? And I want you to bring those back on Monday. Well, that's for these guys, okay? Bring those back next period, okay? If you need, uh, you can, so kind of, kind of consider it a fifth, an open book, take home, 15 point project for you all. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I have several different versions of it, so make sure you write the company name on your template. If you are out of those process cost summary templates, I think you should have enough in your packet, but if by chance you don't, I have a few extras up here. Okay? That's for my face-to-face -face classes. My online students, you guys can tune out for a second. My online students, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to email you a problem that I want you to do, okay? And I am going to email you, um, well, let me back up. I'm going to email you a problem I want you to do. It's also going to be worth 15 points towards your total grade. Now, how do you get that to me? How do you get that to me? Well, there's three ways you can get it to me. If you want, you can uh, fill out your process cost summary by hand. And if you have other classes at JCCC, you can just slide it under my door with your name on it. Okay. Um, the second way you can get that to me is if you fill out your process cost summary template for the answer to that problem, and if you want to scan it in, like as a PDF, and email it to me, you can do that, folks, at home, okay, my online students. Or the third way that you can do it, if you like, online students, is I am going to send you, show the computer, please. I am going to send you a, a, an Excel template, okay? Now, this does not have a bunch of formulas in here that does everything. This is um, simply a way that you can fill out your answer, online students, and then send it to me. Just save the file and, uh, you know, uh, attach the file to an email that you send to me, okay? Now, online students, if you do this, um, I've made it pretty clear, uh, every Every cell that has a yellow, that is uh, in yellow, needs to have uh, a value in there, okay, or something in there. Like here, I want you to put the, the problem number and the company name. Here, I want to make sure you put your name, okay. But online students, that's the third way that you could do this, okay, is to uh, take this email that I send you, fill it in, save it as a file, attach it to an email that you send to me, okay. So you can come off that. So, so online students, you need to do one of those three ways, okay? And look at your red calendar on D2L to see when this is exactly is due, okay? Now, listen careful, carefully to me, folks, online students again. If you send me an email with your answer, either a scanned in written version or you filled out this Excel template, um, in your subject line, say chapter 20 mini project or tw chapter 20 process cost uh, summary, okay? And I will email you back when I get it. If I don't email you back, assume I didn't get it, okay? Because students always try to say, that, oh, I emailed you. You didn't get it? You didn't get it? I sent you an email, okay? So once you send me that online students, I will send you an email back that says I've received this, okay? If I do not reply to you, assume I did not get it. Okay. Now, lastly, online students, if you use that Excel uh, temp uh, template to fill in your answers, you can look back at that again on the computer. I think it would probably be easier if you actually did it by hand on uh, the templates that you have in your handouts and then just transfer your answers over to this once you're done. But somehow, online students, you have to get that to me if you want your 15 points. Okay? All right, you can come off. Everybody else, you're just going to hand it to me next period. Cool?
That's it for chapter 20. It will not be on the next test. Okay? All right? Okay. Now, the one last thing I want to say about chapter 20, though. I just said that's it for chapter 20, and then I said I had something else to tell you. This will be real quick. Okay, we talked about... Um, we talked about chapter 19, and that was job order, right? This was like a custom-built house. It's completely unique, built to order, everything like that, right? Then we talked about chapter 20, which was process costing, right? And that was mass-produced items, like this Sharpie right here, right, that they're producing all the time. Okay? I do want you to understand that there are products that are kind of hybrids, that are, that are in between these. Okay? There are products that are produced that have some characteristics of job order and some characteristics of process costing. For example, I'm getting ready to uh, purchase a new furnace and air condition for my house. Okay? Well, some of that will be process costing. They're making these components somewhere. They're making the different parts of the furnace and the air conditioner somewhere in a kind of a mass-produced way. But some of it will be job order and then I'll say, okay, I want this component put in there. I don't want this one. I want this specialized uh, component put into my furnace. I want a humidifier put in. You know what I'm saying? So that will kind of be job order, although the initial parts were kind of process costing. So that's a little bit of a hybrid in the middle here, right? But of course, it's easier when I'm teaching this to you to teach the extremes, and that's what I did. All right, but I at least want you to be able to uh, be aware that there are some hybrid situations out there. Okay? Cool? All right. Let's go over Chapter 21 homework real quick. Okay, I assigned a few things in there. Um, quick Study 21.1, is that correct? Quick Study 21.1. All right. Listed here are four series of costs measured at various volume levels. Okay. Um, examine each series and identify whether it is best described as a fixed, variable, stepwise, or curvilinear cost. Okay. Okay, we're right there, right? Okay. So. This series right here's the volume and here are the costs for each series. Series one would best be described as what? Variable. It's variable. Okay, now one, one thing I want you to note is that zero volume, there's zero cost. And true variable costs start right there at the corner, don't they? Of the, of the intersection of the x and the y axis. So yes, series one is variable. Okay? Series two, fixed. obviously fixed. It's the same total amount for each volume level. Series three, stepwise. Step and series four, series four? Curvilinear. It's curvilinear, and actually a better option, when, and this was not one of the options that you had, a better option would have been mixed curvilinear. Because at volume level zero, there is a cost, isn't there? So this is a mixed curvilinear cost. You with me? Okay, you can come off that. Any questions on that, folks? Now let's go through the next one, Quick Study 21.2. Determine whether each of the following is best described as fixed, variable, or mixed with respect to product units. Okay, what about rubber used to manufacture athletic shoes? Variable. Variable, yes. The more shoes you produce, the more you'll spend in total, total rubber raw materials. Okay, there's some of these that kind of we need to talk about a little bit. What about maintenance of factory machinery? That'd be mixed. Or fixed. I heard fixed, I heard mixed. Anyone say variable? Okay. All right. I don't think it's fixed. Here's why I don't think it's fixed. Because the more you utilize that machinery, the more it will probably need to be maintained. I, I compare it with my automobile. The more I drive my car, the more I will spend, like on oil changes, in a given period of time. Correct? Okay. So I don't think it's fixed. I think there is some variable element to it. 
okay? So it's either variable or mixed. We know that it's one of those because we know that there's a variable element to it. The question is, is there also a fixed element to it? Now, I know it's not solely fixed, but there could be a fixed element to it along with the variable, okay? Now, you said mixed, Matt. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, even if you don't use it, you're still going to have to probably fix it. It's, it just sits there. It could rust or other damage could happen. And just with time, if you, if you wait a certain period of time, you still have to fix it anyway. I would agree with that. I think that's good reasoning. I think of my automobile. You know, if you don't drive your automobile, you're supposed to still change your oil every now and then, aren't you? Okay. You still have to do maintenance on machines if they are idle or bad things will happen. Okay. So, thus, there's a fixed element. Thus, there's a variable element. I think the best answer is probably mixed. You see why? Okay. Okay, uh, number three is packaging expense. What'd you say? Variable. Variable. I would say variable too, because you'll spend more on packaging expense the more items that you produce and sell. Um, I would have a little question if there was a fixed element in there as well. I don't know what they completely mean by packaging expense. Does that include the total packaging expense? Like, is there a salaried person that work, works in the packaging department? If so, it would be mixed, but variable is probably the best answer there. Okay? The rest of these I don't think are, are too uh, ambiguous. Wages of an assembly line worker paid on the basis of acceptable units produced. Variable. 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 Fact, factory supervisor's salary. Fixed. fixed. Taxes on the factory building. Fixed. It's fixed, right? Depreciation expense of warehouse. Fixed. Fixed. Okay? Now go back to that taxes on factory building. That'll probably be different each year, right? Mm -hmm. That's all right. It's still fixed. The, 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 the argument is this. Those taxes do not increase because we produce more units. They are not variable based on the number of units produced. Does that make sense? Here's another misnomer sometimes students think. They think fixed costs are 100% predictable. Well, I don't think you can probably predict your property taxes, can you? Because it's a pretty complicated you know, calculation each year. The property taxes are still fixed. Okay? All right. Okay. Uh, we had one more, and that was exercise 21-2. Is that right? Okay. Let me... Let me show that on the screen, and we can go through that. Uh, below are five graphs representing various cost behaviors. Identify whether the cost behavior in each graph is mixed, stepwise, fixed, variable, or curvilinear. Okay? I'll have to cover this up because I wrote in my book. All right. Okay. Graph number one. What is this graph? Variable. variable. Fixed. Mixed. That's mixed mm -hmm. because it doesn't start there in the corner. It starts up that y-axis, so there's a fixed element to it. Curvilinear. Curvilinear. Stepwise. Stepwise. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. Questions on that? I know we have the second part to do. We need questions on that? Okay, you can come off that. Let's do the last part of this question that says... Uh, Identify the graph by number that best illustrates each cost behavior. Okay, A, a factory policy that requires one supervisor for every 30 factory workers. Stepwise. That would be stepwise, which is the fifth one, right? Um, B, real estate taxes. Fixed. That would be fixed, which is graph number two. C, Electricity charge that includes the standard monthly charge plus a charge for each kilowatt hour. Mixed. That would be mixed, which is graph number three, right? Uh, D, commissions to salespersons. Variable. Variable, which is graph number one. And lastly, the costs of hourly paid workers that provide substantial gains in efficiency when a few workers are added, but gradually smaller gains in efficiency when more workers are added. That's a curvilinear. Okay, that's, that's 
it increases but not at the same rate. Okay? So that's curvilinear, which is graph number four. <laughs> All right? Okay, any questions? That's it for the homework, isn't it? Should we call it a day or should we keep lecturing? Call it a day. Call no. It a day. I could not do that to you. Folks at home, you can take a break, though, if you want to. I wish I could just hit pause. <laughs> you wish you could hit pause? So does my wife. My teenagers actually wish they could just push stop. <laughs> delete. <laughs> Are you sure you want to delete? Yes. Okay? Um, all right. Let's go over... Um, let's take a look at chapter 20 one uh, again. Okay? Now, we are going to talk about identifying and measuring cost behavior. Okay? We want to, we want to determine the behavior of a cost because then what we can do is we can estimate the future costs. Right? Remember how we talked about, you can come off that, remember when we talked about how total U-Haul cost was, for example, maybe $30 plus 25 cents per mile times the number of miles? Well, if you know that, you can take your activity level that you're going to anticipate, plug it into the equation, and estimate your future costs, right? That's what we want to be able to do, okay? Now, in talking about the U-Haul, going back to the slides, we determined that that was a mixed cost, right? And I want to show you how um, the equation of that would look, okay? Now, what we said was the total U-Haul cost was $30 plus 25 cents per mile, okay? Well, the total cost, the total U-Haul cost would be represented by Y, okay? Would be represented by the variable Y. And the reason is because we keep track of total U-Haul costs on the y-axis, right? We're going to use the variable A to represent the total fixed cost, okay? In our U-Haul example, it was $30, right? And this is where that line is going to intercept or hit that y-axis right there, correct? Then we're going to use the variable B to deter or to represent the variable cost per unit. The variable cost per unit. So in our U-Haul example that I gave you, that would equal 25 cents per mile, right? And we've said that the higher the variable cost, the steeper the line, right? And then finally we're going to use the variable X to represent the level of activity, okay? And we do that because the horizontal axis down here is the x-axis, correct? And the level of activity in our U-Haul example is the total number of miles driven. Are you with me? Okay, so we want to know that equation. Now one thing that we can do is we can prepare what is called a scatter diagram to see if a relationship exists between the x and the y variable, okay? All right, let me talk about, let me talk about this real quick, um, going over to the document camera, okay? Let's say that we don't know, uh, let's say we've used U-Haul a number of times in the past, and let's say for some reason we don't know how total U-Haul costs are, uh, are computed, okay? Now let's say that we think, we think that it is based on the number of miles, but we're not exactly sure. Well, what we could do is this. We could prepare a scatter diagram. This axis would be total U-Haul costs. And let's say we think we're going to see if it's number of, numbers of miles. Okay, number of miles. Well, let's say that we have a bunch of past U-Haul invoices, and of course it has the total cost on there, and let's say that one thing it does record on the invoice, or we wrote it down or whatever, was the number of miles on each job. So let's say we, we plot all these invoices out. 
and we get something like that. Well, that would seem to indicate that there is a relationship between this x and y, total U-Haul costs, correct? Because what you could do there is you could draw a pretty nice line of good fit, correct? Right? And that would seem to indicate that there's a strong relationship between number of miles to total U-Haul costs. And then if you wanted to, you could see where that intercepted the y-axis and that you could use that to kind of predict your future or your fixed costs. And then you could figure out the slope of this line and that would represent your variable cost per unit. Correct? So that is one example of a scatter diagram. Now let's say instead of number of miles, let's say, well, I wonder if total U-Haul costs, if the cost driver for total U-Haul costs, maybe it's not number of miles, maybe it's the uh, temperature of how, how hot it is outside. Okay, now we know that total U-Haul costs have nothing to do with the temperature, right? But let's say you have a bunch of past U-Haul invoices and you know the temperature on each day, okay? Well, you plot out all those plot points from those invoices. And let's say you get something like that. Well, that does not seem to indicate that there's a line of good fit there, does it? So that seems to tell you that temperature has nothing to do with the total U-Haul costs. Or you can maybe say it the other way. Total U-Haul costs have nothing to do with what the temperature was. Yeah, you could try to draw a line in there if you wanted, but that is not a line of very good fit, is it? Okay? You guys might have discussed this in your math classes, right? But I just did it better than your other teachers did, right? Okay? All right. Go back to your slides. You can see that they're saying the same thing just with a little different uh, explanations here, all right? So you could figure out, again, your unit variable cost by figuring out the slope, okay? Now, once we determine, once we determine, folks, that there is a relationship between two variables, we still want to come up with the equation of that line, the y equals a plus b times x. One way that we can do that, kind of a quick and dirty little way, is what is known as the high-low method. And the objective, again, is to calculate the equation of the mixed cost. That y equals a plus b times x. Okay? Now, I've learned that the best way to teach high-low method is actually just to do an example. So we're going to do an example here. All right? Okay. Here's an, here is a series of, of uh, um, months and the units produced and the total cost for each. And let's say we feel that these, this is a situation that is a mixed cost. And we did that perhaps by plotting out a scatter diagram. Okay, the first thing that we want to do here is identify which of these columns is the x variable and which one of these is the y variable. Okay, well, which is the x variable? Units, Units produced. produced. Okay, and total cost is the y variable. Okay? Now what we do, come off that if you would and show me, is once we've identified the X and the Y, there we go, almost show, show it all if you can, then what we want to do actually is we kind of want to cover up the Y's, don't even look at them. Just look at your X's and I want you to, to, to determine which of these is the highest X and which of these is the lowest X. I'm not asking you that which is the highest Y and lowest Y. No, no, no. Cover up the Y so you're not even tempted to look at them right now. Which of these of this, these is the highest X? Which of these is the lowest X? Okay? So going back to the computer, once you do that, which is the highest X? February. February. Okay? That's the high. Which of these is the lowest X? June. June. That is the low. You with me? Okay. So, what we're going to do then, once we've determined the high 
uh, high month and the low month. We're going to actually use all the data from those months now. And we are going to figure out the equation of the mixed cost. Okay? The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine the variable cost. Okay? So let me go back over to the document camera. All right? Okay. Let's figure the first thing we're going to solve for is B, which is the variable cost. Well, that equals the change in Y over the change in X of the high and the low point. Okay? So the change in Y is, um, is it 29,000 minus 20,500? Mm -hmm. Somebody help me. Oops, I just wrote on that. That's right. Okay. Divided by the change in X of the high and the low point. So that would be 67,500 units minus 17,500 units. Is that correct? Yep. So if you compute that out, that comes out to 17 cents a unit. That is the B in our line. Are you with me? Okay. Now the next step is we want to solve for A, which is our fixed cost. The way we're going to do that is we're going to once again consider the entire equation of a mixed cost. We just solved for B. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to borrow the Y and the X from either the high or the low point. Okay? From the high or the low point. So going back to the computer, we're going to use either this X and Y up here or this one down here. Either way, it'll give us the same answer. I usually use the low one because it seems like it's sometimes easier math. Okay? So, what is the Y? What is Y at the low point? 20,500. 20,500. A is what we're trying to solve for. What is X at the low? 17,500. 17,500. Is that correct? Okay. So once you do that, you get 20,500 equals A plus, um, let's see what, 0.17 times 17,500 equals, I think that's 29,75. We can barely see it. Thank you. So 20,500 equals A plus 29,75. So what does A equal? Seventeen five two five. Okay. So we now have our B, and we now have our A. Okay. Now, let me show you how I don't like you to show this answer. Some students will write this out. They'll say, Y equals seventeen five two five plus one seven X. Well, yeah, sort of. But let's go ahead and define these variables times uh, for, for this specific situation. What does y in this situation equal? Well, looking back at the computer, y equals total costs, right? So let's say total costs equals $17,525 plus, well, what does X equal in this example? Units produced, right? So let's say 17 cents per unit produced times the number of units produced. 
Now, doesn't that just give you a better warm fuzzy in your tummy that you really understand what this, what we really did was? Okay. Because now what can we do? Well, now what we can do is once we have that equation right there, let's say we expect an activity level of 20,000 units. Well, what would we expect to be our total costs? Well, we can plug it into that equation and we come up with an answer of 20,925. Are you with me? Okay. That's why we want that equation. So as managers, we plan and control our business, we can try to do costs. Making costs is a huge part of running a business. Are you with me? All right, questions on that? Now, least squares regression, you might have talked about this in a class. Least squares regression is usually covered in statistics class or other cost accounting class that are more advanced. And what you can do is uh, just plug in these different X's and Y's historically and push a button and it will spit out a line of uh, an equation for you. Have you ever done that? Anybody? Okay. Now you can, yeah, you can, you can just plug in a variety of X and Y's, you know, and say what is the equation of this mixed line, this mixed cost line, so to speak. Now. Take a look at what I was showing you before. Remember how we had both of these situations? Okay. Well, you could plug in these data points and it would spit out an equation for you. You could also plug in this one and it would spit out an equation for you as well. So how do you know if it's legitimate data? Does anybody remember what the variable is? It will also give you what is called a number, that, an R squared an R squared, and that tells you how, uh, how good the line fits. Is it a line of good fit, or is it line of not so good fit? Like this one would probably give you an R squared of maybe like 88%. The closer to 100%, the better fit. This would give you an R squared of maybe like 17%. Okay? But least squares regression is something that you might do in statistics classes or something else. Has anybody ever done it? Okay. Um, a lot of the calculators that you have anymore can actually do it. So, all right. Okay, take a look at this slide. I made a special slide for this. Um, it is time to switch gears to a new and a very, very, very important topic. Okay. Do you see how I put a gear shift knob because we're switching gears? Do you see what I did there? You see what I did? All right. Thank you. Okay. Come off this if you would for a second. This is very, very important. If you folks at home need to push pause, go push pause. But these last 10 minutes or so, very, very, very important what we're going to go through. Okay, so I want you to really engage your brain here. Okay? Now, looking at the slides. What we have been doing in the past with our income statement is we have been using the traditional approach where we organize our costs by function. Okay, sales, less cost of goods sold equals gross margin. Less our operating expenses equals net income. Okay, and these were our, our product costs up here. Whoops, our product costs up here. And these were our period costs down here. Remember that? Okay, this is what is actually required for external reporting, such as annual reports. That's the traditional approach. Now, the new approach that we are going to learn is the contribution approach. This organized costs by behavior. So what we do is we take sales minus all of our variable expenses, regardless of whether they're product or period, and we get what is called a contribution margin, a very important concept. Then we subtract out all of our fixed expenses, regardless of the product or period, and then we get our net income. This method is used primarily by management. We're going to find out it's so much more useful. Okay? Now, 
one of the first things when I ever I, that I do whenever I look at an income statement is I look to the middle of the income statement. And if I see gross margin, if I see the term gross margin, then I know it's the traditional approach. If I see contribution margin, I know it is the contribution approach. But you, this is just so important that I can hardly stand it, okay? You need to have a good understanding of this. You're going to use it a lot in the rest of this class as well as managerial accounting, as well as real life, okay? Let's take a closer look at an example of a contribution format income statement. All right. This is a contribution format income statement for ABC Retailer. We see sales less the variable costs equals contribution margin. Then we subtract our fixed costs and we get net income, okay? Now, there were 2,000 units sold. The selling price per unit was $50. 50 times 2,000 is 100,000, right? The variable costs per unit were 30. 30 times 2,000 equals 60,000. The contribution margin per unit is 20. 20 times 2,000 equals 40,000, okay? Now, I want to tell you something real important. Come off there and show me with the screen if you could. Okay. Let's say I did not give you this data, but I gave you this data and this data. Could you compute your per units? Yes. 100,000 divided by 2,000 equals 50. 60,000 divided by 2,000 equals 30. 40,000 divided by 2,000 equals 20. Or 50 minus 30 equals 20. 100,000 minus 60,000 equals 40,000. Because sometimes I will give this data and people say, hey, you, you forgot to tell us the per units. No, you can calculate the per units. Okay? Or another time, sometimes I will not tell you how many were sold, but I'll give you the totals. And I'll give you the per units. And people will say, well, how many were sold? You didn't tell us. Well, you can compute it. Take any of these numbers, divide by that number. 100,000 divided by 50 is 2,000 units. And there are other times I will not give you this data. I'll tell you how many were sold, and I'll tell you the per units, and I'll probably tell you the fixed cost too. But I want you to understand that if you have two of these, you can compute the third. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, this is the contribution income statement at a level of 2,000 units, right? What I want you to do right now is I want to recast this income statement, and I want you to do it at an activity level of... Um, let's do a th uh, 5,000 units. 5,000 units. Okay? Your per units are going to stay the same, but I want you to just take about a minute while they play the music and recast this situation for ABC Retailer at an activity level of 5,000 units.
Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Let's take a look at the Elmo, okay? Well, it's sales minus variable costs equals contribution margin minus your fixed costs equals net income, correct? And we're going to do this for a total of how many units? 5,000 units. Now let's put our per units here, okay? Let's put our per units there. Our per units are 50, 30, and 20. You with me? Now don't do a per unit down here. I told you I don't like to do fixed costs on a per unit basis, right? So don't only do per units up here. Well, what's 50 times 5,000? 250,000. I just see the wrong column. 250,000. What's 30 times 5,000? 150,000. What's 20 times 5,000? 100,000. What's our fixed costs? 30,000. What's our net income? 70,000. 70,000. Are you with me? That should be easy. Now, what if I asked you to cast this not at 5,000 units, but 1,000 units. Folks at home, just push pause and recast it at 1,000 units. We've already done it here. Okay, well sales would be 50 times 1,000, which is what? 50,000. Variable cost would be 30 times 1,000, which is? 30,000. 20 times 1,000 is 20,000. Or 50 minus 30 equals 20,000. What are fixed costs? There's still 30,000. So we have a bottom line that's negative. Is that correct? Now you should be able to recast that easily. All right? Come off that real quick. Let's finish up. Somebody asked me what this FYE stands for up there. That stands for fiscal year end. Fiscal year end. Okay, a couple things I got to show you real quick. Contribution margin. Contribution margin is the amount by which revenue exceeds the variable costs of producing the revenue. Okay, now something that is really important, oh my goodness sakes, this is so important, is the contribution margin per unit. The contribution margin per unit in this case is $20 per unit. We're going to find out in our next lecture how important that is as a number for managers. But that is your CM per unit. And finally, there is something called the CM ratio. We compute the CM ratio by taking your contribution margin divided by your sales. And you could do that on a, on a per unit basis or on a total basis. So if we do it on a per unit basis, it is... 20 divided by 50 equals 40% or 0 0.40, whichever way you want to think about it. Or we could have also taken 40,000 total uh, contribution margin divided by 100,000 total sales and we would have also got 40%. But that is what is known as our contribution margin ratio. Okay. All right, folks, I know that was a lot today, um, but this is just really, really important stuff. Here is what I want you to do for homework, okay? I got a couple handouts and I got something from the book, okay? I want you to do quick study 21.3, and I want you to do exercise 21.9, okay? Now, the other thing that I want you to do, and I will hand this out to you folks here as soon as the cameras are done rolling, is I want you to do this contribution margin shaded box handout as well as the Lorenzo Company handout. So that is your homework, folks. Quick Study 21.3, Exercise 21.9. Shaded box handout, Lorenzo company handout, and also remember to do that 15-point take-home mini project over chapter 20, okay? 
Sorry we went long. Thanks, guys.